This talk is about taming fuzzers. Taming fuzzers means how to control the fuzzer to bend it to your own will. It's like taming wild animals. And I'm very happy to be here today and I'm very happy to talk about fuzzers. Fuzzers. Fuzzers, is, fuzzers are actually, what is a fuzzer? A fuzzer to me sometimes seems like a machine where you can throw in a program and out of the program pops, well, money. How does this work? Well, it's very simple. Um, you let the fuzzer run and the fuzzer then happily produces bugs, out, takes bugs out of the program, produces these, and these bugs then, once it has found all the bugs, and these bugs then translate into bug reports and therefore also bug bounties and these bug bounties then happily go into your piggy bank. And the really cool thing about a fuzzer, at least that's what we think, is that we can just sit by and relax while the fuzzer does everything automatically. So here's the fuzzer, fuzzer does the work, earns money for us, and there we go. Unfortunately, in practice, that's not really what it looks like because, well, fuzzers are not as fast as you might think. In particular, they don't find bugs as fast as you think, so you may spend a long time waiting until you actually, well, get anything out of a fuzzer. And that is mainly because uh, some bugs can be very tricky. See, you have a program, say an interpreter, and you feed it some complex input, and this complex input then creates a failure. Um, <clears throat> and you try to, try to replicate such a bug with a regular fuzzer. The fuzzer is simply going to throw random characters, well, pff, random characters that somehow look like an arithmetic expression to the program. But the problem is that most of these will actually be invalid. And since they are invalid, their interpreter is simply going to say, okay, this is not valid. I'm not going to reproduce any of these bugs. And the question is, how can we teach a fuzzer what an expression looks like? How can we teach a fuzzer what an input looks like? And this is knowledge that, well, we as developers do have, you as a developer might have. And the question is, how can we adapt a fuzzer such that you can plug in, you can throw in this knowledge say, such as uh, your, your knowledge about the domain, your knowledge about the program, about its input, but also about where the weak points are, what needs to be tested. And the question is, how do you control your fuzzer such that you can actually put in all the knowledge you need? So in this talk, I'm going to talk about two things here. One is customizing fuzzers. That is how to provide knowledge about the program and its domain. And the second part is controlling fuzzers, that is getting the fuzzer to do exactly what you want. Oh, and we start with the first part, that is customizing fuzzers. Customizing fuzzers. I'm going to use a word which many of you do not necessarily like, at least that's my impression. There's a saying by Richard Feynman, uh, the physics researcher, who has said that every formula in the book reduces the audience by half. For me, the same happens with the word grammar. And I'm fully aware that many of you do not like the word grammar. Yes, this was a puking smiley. But there are actually quite a number of tools that use grammars to produce correct inputs. Uh, we, have had, we have had a couple of people here aligned at FASCON. There is Cornelius Aschermann with Nautilus. There's Marcel Böhm with Eiffel Smart. We have Christian Holler, who hasn't talked about it, but he has built a very nice grammar-oriented um, fuzzing tool for JavaScript called Langfuzz, and then there's me. And there's quite a number of other people at Microsoft, at Google, at other places who actually have built such uh, grammar-based fuzzers. The idea of a grammar is that you can specify what the input looks like. Here is a sort of canonical grammar. Uh, this is a grammar for arithmetic expressions. I'm sure you've seen something of that because this is the canonical examples. A grammar specifies the set of inputs, and we do have an expansion rule. We do have non-terminals and we do have terminals, and that's about as formal as it gets. Grammars are frequently used to parse inputs, but that's not how we're going to use them here. Instead, we're going to use them as producers of inputs, which makes them particularly useful for fuzzing. How does one use a grammar as a producer? Well, you start with a start symbol, a conveniently named start. And uh, you have these rules in the grammar by which you can explain which you can replace. One, one non-terminal symbol by an expansion. We have just exp uh, changed 
uh, start by expression. Expression expands into term minus expression. Term expands into factor. Factor expands into integer minus expression. And uh, <clears throat> we have integer that expands into digit. We have digit that expands, integer that expands into another digit. And we have a digit that expands into eight. And we have another a digit that expands into two. And by uh, repeating this game again and again, you will eventually get, well, an arbitrary complex arithmetic expression, which you then can happily feed into the program of your choice. Assuming it takes arithmetic expressions, you're going to, uh, you're going to get uh, millions of valid inputs this way, which very quickly cover all the behavior. And all of these inputs are valid. That is, you get to see actual functionality, and you can test the program way beyond uh, input processing. Um, and this is not just pure theory. Um, this is we, we actually got hooked on that through a Christian Holler, who used to be a master student of mine, because what he did was he used a JavaScript grammar that went into a fuzzer called Langfuzz, which he used to test JavaScript interpreters of Firefox, Chrome, and Edge. And uh, yes, uh, Christian hasn't told you about it, but he found very many bugs in these. Last thing. I, Last time I talked to him, it was 2,600 bucks. So Christian, I know you're here, so uh, please prove me wrong. And um, <clears throat> this, actually, if you look at this, in, if you look at this talk in your browser right now, um, chances are that this was heavily tested with uh, Langfuzz. Christian became very famous, uh, actually, when he did that, because in the first four weeks, he raked in more than $50,000 in bag bounties. And yes, testing with grammars can be highly efficient. Um, we are <clears throat> actually um, together with uh, Christian and also Marcel Böhme, whom you're earlier today. Uh, I, we wrote a book called The Fuzzing Book. Marcel briefly mentioned that. And this is where we have put in, put together plenty of algorithms um, around all around fuzzing in, right, in this, <clears throat> right in this book. And you can read them. You can execute them right in your browser. There's quite a, quite a number of material in there. One thing that is a bit open, though, is if you want to fuzz with grammars, you have to do the effort of creating grammars in the first place. And the question is, where do you get the grammar from? And this can be quite some effort. We have done some work in mining such grammars from programs. So this year we're presenting Mimid, <clears throat> that is a tool which actually takes a C or a Python program and a set of inputs and automatically infers the grammar for these inputs which is really cute because you can feed these into a fuzzer, you can use, feed these into a parser, or you can give them to humans. And this aspect of giving these grammars to humans is particularly neat because the grammars that are produced by Mimit are actually very readable. So as an example, here is a, a grammar for JSON that is extracted by Mimit as it is. And what and if you wonder what is a JSON, well, a JSON is, uh, is either a string, or it is a list, or it is a dictionary, or it's a number, or it's true, or false, or null. So this is almost like, te like textbook quality. And what is a list? Well, a list is, we already have seen the opening bracket up here. Here's the closing bracket. Either it's an empty list, or it is a list of uh, JSON elements, followed by more JSON elements separated by commas, closing with, again, a square bracket. So this is, and the identifiers actually also are extracted from the program by Mimit. It takes these identifiers from program identifiers. And this is something that you can actually give to a human in order to work with. So one of our ideas here is that you can go and take Mimit to extract a grammar, then you don't have to write it, feed it into a fuzzer, and then it goes into an interpreter. But then, there are still limits to that, what you can extract from existing programs, because, well, A, Mimit is a research prototype, and B, it is also limited, well, <laughs> to grammars. What do you do if you have a more complex input, such as a binary input, for instance? Ah, the answer is very simple. You go and take one of the existing grammars that are all around there. Well, where do you find existing grammars for existing file formats? Um, yeah, that's actually a problem. This slide represents the entirety of uh, grammar formats that are around in the wild. And as you can see, you see nothing. And that's exactly what I see. This is why we created 
uh, grammar mining in the first place. However, <clears throat> there are sources of input formats, and we recently stumbled across a very nice repository of uh, format specifications, and these are supplied uh, as part of an editor, the 010 editor. This editor has a binary template repository. This is an editor which allows you to edit and view binary files, and for this, it has a number of file format descriptions for a big number of so-called binary templates. And here's the repository for it. This repository contains plenty of, um, pl <clears throat> plenty of files for use with the editor. We have various formats for archives, for various audio files, for CAD files, for document files, for electronic uh, inputs, whatever there is. Executables, of course, fonts. Fonts is cool and of course also image uh, descriptions and everything. There is a total of um, 170 different formats described in here. And the idea is whether we can make these file formats available for fuzzing. Now I'll take you and have a look into one of these existing input format specifications. This, for instance, is the PNG file, uh, the PNG uh, format, and you can if you read through this, you already get an idea of how complex these input formats are. Actually, it's a miracle that modern fuzzers, after a couple of hours, managed to, managed to create one of these. Um, because you look into these and you find, well, there's quite a number of different, of different types in there, different numbers, different, kind, different kinds of inputs. In particular, the PNG format, for instance, is a series of chunks. And we have all these chunks in here, so you have whatever. We have a charm chunk. We have a text chunk with all sorts of, there's also lengths in here, which is very complicated for a, a regular grammar. Well, since it's context free to actually infer. And you also have a big, this is the description that says which different chunks there are. And although, well, this, this, is, this comes in C syntax, right? But, and I, I guess that many of you in here love C syntax much more than they would love formal grammar syntax. But technically speaking, this is actually, this is actually a grammar, you know? Uh, what we have here is a rule that says a chunk is either a header chunk or a text chunk or a PLDE chunk or a charm chunk. So actually these two are interchangeable up to some extent because this, these binary templates also contain code. And this code in particular is there for checking checksums and for expressing constraints that couldn't be expressed in a context-free grammar. So this is what we want to use for uh, building a fuzzer. And for this purpose, we built a binary fuzzer compiler, which actually, this is, and this is called format fuzzer. And what this thing does is it takes a, it takes a binary template, and we feed these into the format fuzzer compiler, and um, this then creates an executable, an executable program that produces inputs. And compiling these things into an executable is extremely is extremely efficient because you can generate thousands of valid inputs per second. And mind you, these are syntactically and semantically valid. So it's not like the fuzzer would have to search how to create a GIF file. No, these are valid in the first place. And this is lots of fun because you can make, make much more, uh, you can make, make an, you, your time is used in a much more efficient way. And um, in the long run, what we want to do is to make this format fuzzer usable for all the formats that are around in the in this in these repositories so from gif png bash css whatever you name it and therefore create highly efficient fuzzers for all of these formats so um, since this is so nice let me give you a demo on how format fuzzer works so here we are so this is the web page for Format Fuzzer. Um, actually, if you go to the Slack of the of this talk, you'll also find the presentation with all the links for Format Fuzzer. So here we are. This is Format Fuzzer itself. This is the web page for it. 
and there's a GitHub page, and there you can. This is where you can look up everything about uh, Format Fuzzer. Let me now go into the actual directory where I've just checked this out. Here we go. So Bob, it's the usual. It's, it's the usual. Uh, most of this actually is setup stuff and readmes and whatnot. The interesting part is well, um, the interesting part is actually in the templates directory. This is where we can find our binary formats. I'll go briefly and show you the. Oops, no, that's not what I want. So here we go. This is the GIF format, for instance. We just seen PHG. Here's GIF. And you can see, well, what is a GIF? And we have RGB codes, and we have, <laughs> what was that? Logical screen descriptor of packed fields. All the stuff that people come up with. Yes, here we go. And yes, this is all, this is the full description of GIFs as we have it. And now I can use format fuzzle to actually compile this. Let me see whether this all works. So we're going to start and create a C++ file. And I'm using this uh, little FF compile compiler here. This is part of format fuzzle. This is the main part. And now I have created a C++ file. Here we go, gif.cpp. And this is now something, well, this is generated C++ code. You can certainly look into it and you can edit it if you really want to, but it's not that much fun. What you can do though with it, you can go and compile it and let's simply say, I want to, well, that's going to be easy. I'm simply going to compile it into an object file. And here we go. This is, this is actually quite complex. So uh, takes a moment for the compiler to compile it. And once we have compiled it after quite some time, my compiler is slower today than usual. I can now go and link all of this into a single executable and make a GIF fuzzer. It was much faster. And this is now something that I can execute, GIF fuzzer. Here we go. Uh, it supports multiple commands, for instance, fuzz. Now I can create foo.gif. And if I create foo.gif, well, what I get is a foo.gif. Actually, this is very fast so just to show this off. So it takes about a millisecond, two milliseconds actually, to create this. And what does foo.gif look like? We can look into it. Oh yeah, well, this is a single, this is a single GIF. Ah, just I tried this out, I tried this out a couple of minutes ago, and then we actually had an animated GIF. Here we just have one, but yeah, that's good enough. And of course, I can now feed this into arbitrary programs and have fun with that. One interesting part is that not only does the part that does the um, does the fuzzer support fuzzing, but it also supports parsing. So I can actually go and parse the image again. And we have provided some uh, mechanisms to actually convert the to actually go and convert the um, to actually go and convert the decisions made during parsing and during fuzzing into binary, into bitstream files. And these bitstream files can actually be mutated. And if you mutate these bitstream files, then you can, generate, you can uh, again, generate new inputs from them, which allows you to very easily integrate such a framework with uh, tools like AFL and the like. So you may have noticed we have, we would simply create these things. We don't even look into the program that uh, processes them. We can, we can now go and send these generated GIF files whatsoever over the network to whatever program, and we don't even have to look into the program. So this is, at this point, this is a fully, this is a full black box fuzzer, but we are setting things up such, you can, such that you can combine these with arbitrary testing strategies. So if you go to the Slack, uh, if you go to the Slack, you'll find the annotated version of these slides. And this is also where you can find the, where you can find the um, fuzzer itself, or you can be extremely quick and simply take a look and take a screenshot of this and have a look at our repository. Um, fun part here is um, we're making this open source today. We want to we want to release new formats every week. As soon as we have a dozen high quality formats available, we'll also announce this uh, on a larger scale and make releases. And we are looking for contributors who will be happy to help us with providing more and more binary templates. So this is about Format Fuzzer. I think this is a really exciting project and with plenty of potential for the upcoming weeks and months. 
And I'm, I'd, I'd be very happy to see your ideas, as issues listed, or possibly even some pull requests for that very for that very project. Um, this is about this is about how you can provide knowledge about the program and the domain. And if you do have knowledge about what a file format looks like, yes, you can make fuzzers far more effective. The second part of the talk is about how to get the fuzzer to do what you want. And let's go back to our grammar here. You see, we think of such grammars as being useful in simply providing the right input. But that's not all there is. Something that is hardly ever explored so far is the power that such readable specifications actually give um, <clears throat> actually give humans in, when, they, when they want to control what is to, what is supposed to be generated. For instance, we can go and we can assign individual probabilities to individual productions. So here I said, well, I want a 10% chance of creating a list and I want a 50% chance of creating a dictionary. And I can send this to my fuzzer and then my fuzzer is going to generate plenty of dictionaries and almost no lists. Remember what Christian Holler had said about obstacles this morning, fuzzing obstacles with such probabilities, you can, pro you can avoid many of these obstacles. An even more interesting thing is that you can actually go and insert magic strings into the grammar that a program analysis would have a very hard time finding out. For instance, um, here I'm adding a special kind of string into my JSON. So this is drop table students. This is a reference to the world famous XKCD comic. And if I, if I put this into a fuzzer, and then I'm asking the fuzzer to generate inputs from this very grammar, what I'm going to get is plenty of JSON inputs that are all syntactically valid, but where each of them actually contains a small drop table students in there. And well, send this to a, an application of your choice and see what happens. Do this only in theory. Do not do this at home unless you are specifically allowed to do so. So this is this this is some bit of fun already. And sure, you can do the same with usernames, passwords, all the stuff that would be very hard to figure out for a regular fuzzer. This idea of um, adapting a grammar towards a specific need, this is something that we have just explored in a very recent work where we are introducing a so-called grammar transformer, which takes an input grammar and a so-called failure pattern, and out of this produces a specialized grammar, which then can go into a fuzzer or into a parser. What is such a failure pattern? Um, we can look into this. A failure pattern is a constraint on a particular set, on a particular uh, feature of the grammar, where we can say, OK, I want, spe I want specific patterns to occur or not to occur. For instance, I can say, well, I want one JSON dict that contains the username Zeller and the password 1234, this, which then means that every single input that's going to be generated will have at least one such dictionary. I can also say at least one string should be a SQL injection, and then I can uh, link this to a special grammar that produces SQL injections. I can also create Boolean formulas out of that, which is a pretty unique feature. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first mechanism that allows you to actually, to actually tell a grammar that something should not be included. But yes, you can say, I want no floating point numbers and I want no null key values in my grammar. And every time what comes out of this is a specialized grammar that satisfies these constraints and these, this specialized grammar is still a context-free grammar, and you can, you can put this into an arbitrary grammar-based um, grammar fuzzer. And you can also use it to parse whether they're appropriate, uh, to check whether the uh, conditions are met or not. We can also combine this with what we've seen earlier with binaries. So a PNG chunk, I want particular, I want particular chunks in my PNG file. I want to avoid specific chunks because my program is going to crash on them anyway, and there's something I know already. Or I want specific, I want specific color formats what's, because I've recently changed them, or because I think there might be more vulnerabilities in there. This is something that does not work yet because we haven't brought these to 
uh, branches together. But this is something we're working on. And imagine the control that this gives you over what should be first. And one particular nice thing in here is these failure patterns, which I so far have assumed would be specified by a human, can also come from can also come from a program. We also have research, this is all recent work, so-called failure generalizers, which take a set of failing inputs and an input grammar and automatically produce such failure patterns that actually express all the ways a program could fail. What does that mean? Well, simple example. Here's a program under test, and I give it a particular input, and then it fails. OK, there we go. This is classical fuzzing. You just found that the program just found one particular input for which the program fails. And the question is, does this hold for other inputs too? Now, of course, you can now run your fuzzer again and again. Uh, but you want to actually search in the vicinity of the failing input, whether there are other similar inputs that also cause the program to fail. And for this, what we have built is a system that takes, that parses this input. And then out of this parse comes, well, if you've been in compiler construction, a derivation tree. And this derivation tree then represents the structure of this input according to the structure of the grammar. And in this derivation tree, we can now go and replace individual values by others. For instance, if you want to know whether the failure would occur for other integer values too, what we can do here is we can replace, say, one integer by simply another integer by uh, simply using the grammar again as a producer. And then we can replace the 8 by 27, and we are still syntactically valid. And we can check whether the error occurs here too. And yes, it does. And if we repeat this a number of times, if we repeat this a number of times with various inputs, here's the original, and here's another one that also fails, and here's the third one that fails, and here's the fourth one that fails, uh, we can now go and generalize, a, uh, generalize an, uh, a pattern out of this, which we can actually generalize further. This is the, in our example, the generalized pattern, which tells us that the error occurs whenever multiplication is used with minus. Now, for a more complex input, like a GIF, you would get something more complex than that. But the thing is, such a pattern describes all possibilities under which a particular error occurs. And this then, besides getting plenty of test cases for the failure, this is really nice, this then can now go as a failure pattern into our grammar transformer. And if you take the failure pattern, put it into the grammar transformer, you get the specialized grammar. And this specialized grammar will now go and produce one, instantiate one failure pattern after another. It will produce plenty of inputs that all contain the failure pattern. And yes, you can, you can find plenty of bugs in the vicinity of it. How do I know that this actually works in practice? Well. That was one of the secret sources of the Langfuss puzzle, or puzzle of Christian Holler, because not only did it use a JavaScript grammar for uh, producing, it also used it for parsing. And it, he was using um, existing old bugs that were reported already, he parsed them, recombined them, and then we would search in the vicinity of these bugs. And this was tremendously effective. And this is why we now have made a bit of a, bit of, bit of, bit of a science out of that. So this is controlling fuzzers, getting a fuzzer to do exactly what you want, providing patterns that tell you, I want more of this and less of this and not this, but maybe this, but this other ingredient, please fuzzer, get this done for me. Actually, we should rename our fuzzers to genies or something. Genie, get this stuff done. That's, this, is, this is what I want to have here, okay? And this, of course, is a different perspective than your standard, well, your standard security, your standard security perspective. Here's this program I don't know nothing about. Here's my fuzzer. Let me throw this into the fuzzer and then let these things just churn through and I don't want to know anything about it. If you know things and if you have the knowledge, you want it to be able to put this into use and your fuzzer is going to be so much more efficient and it's going to be so much more effective. One downside of this is, well, you only get valid inputs. That's, that's what a security researcher one time told me. But you know, <clears throat> there's plenty of fuzzers which give you invalid inputs. That's not what we're looking for. 
We are looking for valid inputs that go beyond syntax errors and get deep into the program that actually that actually reach functionality. There's virtually no chance a fuzzer like AFL could ever go and synthesize something like a SQL injection or like things. Well, if you have the knowledge of how this is being made, yes, you can actually build appropriate tools. And yes, these tools can be extremely powerful and extremely extremely powerful and uh, can make can sometimes make you feel like a demigod when you're running. I would like to point out the two very wonderful people who are behind all of this. I'm doing the slides and sometimes giving advice, but there's actually people who do all the work. And these two people in this case are first Rafael Dutra, postdoc of mine, who has been working hard in the past Wow, how many months? At least six months, I guess, uh, on the on format fuzzer, getting this to run and getting this to work. So this is all his work. Well, almost, <laughs> almost all his work. Um, and he's and he's the one who, who gives this tool to you. And the second person to second person is my other postdoc, Rahul Gopinath, and he's the person behind generalizing failures into patterns and using these patterns actually to specialize grammars towards specific goals. Now we want to bring these two strands together, doing all of this for binary formats too, and there's plenty of exciting research on the horizon at this point. These two are postdocs, and they are working with me at CISPA. If you haven't heard of CISPA yet, CISPA is the German Helmholtz Center for IT Security. Helmholtz centers are the centers at in Germany, the research centers in Germany, which are the biggest ones, and CISPA is no exception. We <clears throat> plan to extend to more than 800 researchers. That's 800 research positions from PhD to faculty in the next couple of years. And we do have funding for that. Our funding does not depend on the number of students or students who may or who may not come to work or whatsoever. We do have these, we do have these positions, we do have the money. We are growing and we are hiring. So on this slide, you see one building that's one of seven that's in the making. And um, yes, if you have any interest in such research, if you ever, if you always wanted to do a PhD or if you do have a PhD and plan to go for a postdoc, or if you already have spent time as a postdoc and want to go for a tenure track position, or if you want to go for a tenured position or you have tenure already and you want to go for better tenure, yes, please let us know. It's truly exciting all day to work, not only in a corridor filled with security research, not even in a building filled with security researchers, but actually an entire campus filled with security researchers. Picture that, this is what we build. Okay, this was my uh, short advertising. And I'd like to close. What have we seen? We've seen things, something about taming fuzzers, which is adapting fuzzing to your needs, putting in your domain knowledge, your program knowledge into the fuzzer. I've shown you the format fuzzer, the binary, the binary fuzzer compiler, which allows you to produce binaries at a at tremendously high speed and high quality. This is the, this project is at its very early stage. We're going to make first releases in a couple of weeks, but you're very much invited to take a peek and possibly to contribute to it. I've shown you how to customize grammars towards specific goals. That is, um, that is, specializing grammars such that they contain or do not contain specific patterns, which actually also can come. Uh, can be generalized automatically from given failures. And with this, and if you're interested in any of this, you can go and follow me on, you can go and follow me on Twitter. This is where we announce everything that we have around here. And in the, and in the chat room, in the Slack chat room, you will also find an annotated version of these slides. Go to the last slide and you'll find all the links that you need um, that I, to all the material which I mentioned in this talk. This is what I have about this is what I have about taming fuzzers, and I think there's quite some interesting perspectives for future fuzzing tools on the horizon. 
Thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure. So thank you, Andreas. So and now, do you hear me? Actually, I'd like Apparently to hear the window, but I can't find out how. Okay, here we here I have it. Okay. Um, I'm seeing question. I'm, I'm seeing questions here. So again, moderators. I cannot hear the moderators. So, should yeah. I go and answer questions right away? Yeah, just do that. Yeah. We have a. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. We're doing sign language here. This is fun. Okay, I'm <laughs> having about five minutes or so to answer answer questions. So I'm going to randomly pick a couple of questions in here. Oops. Okay. Okay. Um, Blah, blah, blah. Oh, this is, there are many questions. Okay. Um, what do we have here? Now seeing the presentation. Blah, 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 blah. It's not, oh, okay. Langfors before. Yes, Langfors has been used. Christian Holler has all the answers for, for Langfors. And this is insanely awesome. Yeah, we just released it. Wonderful. Okay. That's fun. That's fun too. Um, I'm looking for questions in here. Um, <laughs> there's plenty of answers already. Um, let me see. I don't think it's necessary to know that's a silly question. Where is the source code available? Was the URL in the slides? Yes, all the URLs in the slides. Go to the Slack and I will, and you will find the annotated version of the slides here. And it's also in the Slack. Thank you very much, Raphael. Have you done any experiment with context sensitive input formats like C, C? Um, at this point, the at this point, the furthest we can get is with JavaScript. We have well, Mimi is actually able to mine the grammars for JavaScript, but we still have trouble with the context sensitive parts. So, getting all the identifiers and scoping rules from a compiler, <laughs> this is slightly beyond our capability at this point. But um, we are working hard on that. Can one convert an Antler language into 010? Yes, you can. Actually, you can convert any grammar into 010. That's not too complex. Um, so what else do we have? Um, for Antler grammar, yes, here we go. Does format feather act also like a file format mutator? Yes, it does. The basic capabilities are all there. It can parse inputs into an AST, for instance. And it can also, it can also produce inputs. The easiest way to do this is you parse the input. You get, um, you can get a list of so-called dependency uh, of so-called decision files. These decision files are these decision files contain all the decisions that the that the parser made. So which branch, which which parsing alternative it took, and then you can mutate these um, decision files and then use these decision files again mutated to produce uh, new outputs. And one, so you can think of, you can actually think of these, of this format fuzzer as a translator from bitstream files into valid grammar files. And in these bitstream files, actually all mutations lead to valid inputs again. So you can <clears throat> actually use this in conjunction with AFL. We're putting up a tutorial on, up, up on this quickly. So what else do we have? Clap, yeah, I see that. We can hear the moderators. Yeah, I can't hear them, that's too bad. Um, <clears throat> can you talk about the difference between format fuzzer and lib protobuf mutator? <clears throat> you could, you can actually go and uh, you can actually go and use all these binary. You can take all these. Um, you can take all these binary formats. I'm sure there is a conversion possible between protobufs and these binary templates, and then you may be able, you may be able to use these as well. But we haven't done a comparison yet on what this what this looks like. Um, and would it be would it be possible to handle programming and languages just as well? Yes, but we aren't there yet. We are still at uh, we are still at uh, very we are still at the more simpler formats where simple actually something like GIF and PNG from the standpoint of grammar fuzzing actually already are very complex formats. So these are some of the these are some of the questions that we put up. If you have if you have any ideas on how to use format fuzzer or how to how to um, how to or how to use it, go to the repository, file in issues and ideas, and put them up into the and put them up in the um, as issues in there. We'll be happy to talk to you, 
or just go directly into the chat window, in which we also have questions. Have we tried integrating swarm testing? Yes, we can. This is obvious because um, Formbit Fuzzer is highly effective and we'll be super happy to set this up together with swarm testing. And does format fuzzer also act as a file format mutator? Yes, it does. So, and there are, and we can read in, we can parse existing inputs, we can mutate them, we can write them out again. This is all, this is all prepared for in the, this is all prepared for in the interface. And I'll be happy to, I'll, I'll be happy to explore possibilities with you. Okay, and this is already the end of the talk. I think I'm exactly at the, I think I'm exactly at the limit. I still cannot hear the moderators, so I hope folks, I hope folks you like this thing. Thank you also very much for Raphael and my team for actually answering questions while I was talking. And thank you very much for attending. It was a pleasure, thank you. And I'll be around in the, I'll be around in the taming fuzzle slack for the time being. So if you have any questions, feel free to answer them. Feel free to ask them in there and I'll be around. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we heard a lot about taming fuzzers now. And uh, great thanks to Raphael and the others who were even answering in the chat while uh, the presentation was still going on. That was very 